So lesson 13.2 is about distribution channels, and we're going to look at the differences between producers and consumers and talk about direct and indirect channels of distribution. So to start out with, a channel of distribution is basically made up of all the companies who participate in getting that product from the producer into the hands of the consumer. And that can be really simple, going directly from the producer to the consumer if you order something directly from a manufacturer, or it can be really complex and have multiple people in between. And so this image kind of gives you um, a picture of some of the people who could be in that channel. Could be warehouses, could be distribution centers, could be retail stores, uh, manufacturers, and to the end user. And so just kind of a little visual there for you. So um, the channel distribution will basically can adjust the differences between things that producers and consumers, some of their goals that they have. And so a lot of times producers goal might just be to make as much and sell as much as they can, whereas a consumer's needs might be a little bit different than that. And so the channel of distribution is there to mostly match to the customer's needs. So I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on. So um, some of the differences could be differences in quantity, meaning that, you know, like I just said a minute ago, the producer wants to produce a whole bunch, whereas different retailers may only want a few things. And so, for example, Nike might make, you know, 10 million pairs of a certain type of shoe, but a retailer like Dick Sporting Goods only wants to buy 5,000 of them. There's a huge difference there. Could be differences in assortments like sizes, colors, things like that. Um, location. So Nike might make their all of their products in a different country through their manufacturers, and they've got to get them to other countries to sell them into stores. So location, and then also timing. Um, a good example of timing right now is the vaccine because they're, it, they're making that vaccine and then it has to stay a certain temperature before it gets into the arms of people. And so timing is a huge thing with that. Um, seasonal things are also an example of timing. We talked a little bit about that in the first lesson when we talked about utility and time utility and stuff and that, you know, seasonal things like Halloween and Christmas and Valentine's Day and even your swimsuits versus your winter coats and stuff is a timing issue also. So our seven functions of marketing. The seven functions of marketing are selling, market planning, product service management, pricing, which is also sometimes called financing, promotion, marketing information management, and channel management, which is also called distribution. So we're going to be looking really strongly at this channel management part. So when we talk about it as a function, um, all of those functions, all seven of those functions that I just went through in the last slide have to be met at some point or time. And so the channel of distribution depends on you know, if it's a direct or an indirect, who does that? So in any exchange between the producer and the consumer, they all have to be done. So some examples of how different companies or different people in the channel of distribution do different functions. Trucking companies, railroads, airlines, trains, they handle the transportation, the physical movement of the product from point A to point B. And then you have banks and finance companies that deal with credit and deal with the financing part. You have wholesalers that deal with product management and um, will act kind of as that in-between person, which I will talk more about in the next lesson. And then you have advertising agencies, television companies, radio stations, even the internet, um, social media sites that deal with promotion. So those are all just some examples of how different people in that chain can handle different functions of marketing. So when other businesses come into the channel distribution and take over some of those responsibilities, it makes it things run a little bit smoother. If you have, you know, only one thing you have to be in charge of, then it's a lot easier to make sure that that's done correctly. So this is just kind of a visual that shows that 
if the number of exchanges in, between producer and consumer, if that is a planned out distribution, organized and planned out, um, it goes and it goes through a retailer. Um, it's a lot smoother than if you're just crazy going. If this producer is trying to sell to all these consumers and this producer selling to all these consumers and back and forth, that it gets a little bit crazy in there. And they all have to, all of these producers have to do all seven of those functions of marketing. Whereas here, you're, you know, tie, the retailer's doing the selling and the pricing and some of those kinds of things. So it takes a little bit of pressure off of the producer when you have more people in the chain. So channel participants, let's get into details on that. You can have a direct channel or an indirect channel. So channel participants are everybody that are involved in getting product physically moved from point A to point B. If it goes directly from the producer to a consumer, it's called a direct channel. If there are other people in between or other companies in between, then it's an indirect channel. So I'm going to talk first about indirect channels of distribution. They're typically used in the sale of consumer products. And so it is, and that's kind of changing a little bit with online sales, but typically you have a producer like Nike or someplace like that, and they sell the products that they produce to a retailer or a wholesaler. And then they sell to the consumer. So in this first one, they sell directly to the retailer. So for example, would be maybe Nike straight to Dick's Sporting Goods. And then you, the, you and me, the consumer, go into Dick's Sporting Goods and buy the product. In this example, they go through a wholesaler. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what a wholesaler is in the next lesson. But a wholesaler is going to be somebody who buys in bulk from the producer and then sells off to other retailers. So for instance, Nike's the producer. You have a wholesaler, Nike produces 10 million pairs of those shoes. This wholesaler buys a million of them, sells 5,000 of them to Dick's Sporting Goods and 5,000 of them to another company and 5,000, you know, and so they sell to multiple retailers. And then the consumer goes into those retailers and buys those products. The issue here for you as a consumer, you and me as a consumer, is that each person in this chain wants to make a profit. And so if you got more people in that chain, by the time it gets to the consumer, that price is going to be higher. And so that's why sometimes um, wholesale, direct wholesale companies that go right to the consumer and skip that retailer can give you prices a little bit cheaper. If you can get it right from the producer, you can get it cheaper. Because the producer, let's just say Nike buy, makes these shoes and sells them to the wholesaler for $30, who then sells them to the retailer for $50 who then sells them to you for $100. So each line in the chain, each, each person in the chain or company in the chain has to make a profit, which is gonna make that end price a little bit higher. If you go direct channels of distribution, in the past, direct channels of distribution used to be business to business, like the producer directly to a wholesaler or directly to a retailer. But that has changed a lot with online sales because anymore you can go online to like a little boutique or who makes their own stuff and buy it directly from them. You can buy directly from producers right on the internet. And um, so it is becoming more and more common for direct channels of distribution to be business to consumer. But typically in the past, it's always been business to business. So things that are changing with that internet sales, small numbers of consumers use direct channels. Another, consumers are located in a geographical area, and so direct channels are easy to, to just go right to them. If you have a complex product that has to meet specific needs, so maybe it's made specifically for you, um, it would be a direct channel. And then if a business wants to maintain real good control over what's happening, they might use a direct channel of distribution. So some things that help you develop and manage your channel, um, cooperation or conflict. And it says each member, channel member has its own goals and this can cause conflict if the goals conflict. So an example of that would be the example that we read in the book yesterday where the 
game maker made this high end educational game for kids and their thought process was that that was going to go into high end educational type stores, not Walmart, not Target, not Toys R Us. And they were going to sell it for a high price with this elaborate display. Well, they sold it then to the dis the wholesaler who didn't deal with those kinds of companies. They dealt with Walmart and Target and the, and the discount stores. And so they sold it then to the discount stores who didn't use the displays because they didn't have room for it. They just stuck it on the shelves, which took away from the selling value or from the ability to sell it. They also didn't charge the price that the original producer wanted to charge. So that those were different goals and those can conflict and those can cause issues. Um, channel management responsibilities. A channel captain sometimes is assigned to oversee all the distribution activities and it might be somebody from the pro producing company or one of the others and they oversee what each channel member is gonna be responsible for and make sure that they're getting it done. And then there's some software because most companies today are gonna to use some type of computer software to keep track of what's going on in the, in the channel. The supply chain management software makes collection and management of that information a lot easier. And then CRM or customer relationship management software is going to target um, your customers and, and analyze who they are and keep track of sales records and requests and returns and keeps track of all the basic details of selling and stuff in there. So this is just a visual of an example of an indirect channel of distribution for a carpet manufacturer. So you have the carpet manufacturer, you have the end users, which might be a business or a home, an individual. The manufacturer might sell to a wholesaler. They also might sell to a builder. They also might sell to a retail chain like Nebraska Furniture Mart or Big Bob's Carpet. And then from there, the wholesaler might sell to an independent carpet installer. They also might sell to like a smaller home decorating store. And then they may go straight to a builder. The wholesaler sometimes can go to the builder too, but there's just not an arrow in here for it. This is just an example. So you need new carpet in your house. You go to this national carpet chain, Nebraska Furniture Mart, and you buy your carpet. So there's just two, boom, boom. You might be building a new house. And so your builder is putting your carpet in. Or uh, you may go through an independent carpet installer or a home decorating store. Again, think about this. If you're going here to here to here, only one other person in that chain has to make a profit. If you're going here to here to here to here, you got three people in between the manufacturer and you that have to make a profit on your carpet. And so you got to think about the pricing there and who, how many, you know, they all want to make a profit. So your end cost is going to end up being more. So an example of math, a tomato farmer has used indirect distribution to sell at local consumer through area farmers market. Kind of like the one we have up on Independence Square, the new farmers market. Takes all your tomatoes up there, sell them for $2.49 a pound. Um, they're 53 pounds in a bushel. They sold 400 bushels. So their revenue, you're going to take 249 per pound times 53 pounds, because they're 53 pounds in a bushel, gives you basically $131.97 of revenue per pound times 400 or per bushel times 400 bushels. It gave them a revenue of 52,788. This year, they're look, you're looking at maybe going through a grocery store or a supermarket. The supermarket wants to make a profit too, so they're only going to pay you $1.63 a pound. But they, they're going to buy 650 bushels versus your 400 bushels. So you're not getting as much a pound, but you're selling more. So you can look at it that way. At $1.63 times 53, because there's 53 pounds in a bushel, gives you $86.39 a bushel times 650. So overall, your overall revenue is going to be more and you're going to sell more. So it, you know, people just kind of got to look at what's your overall goal. Is your overall revenue your goal? Is your overall price per pound your goal? The difference here is that 
people tend to pay more at a farmer's market because they know it's fresh than they would at a grocery store. So here's some review questions for you to ponder. And that's the end of this lesson.